Welcome to this episode of My Diabetes HQ Live. My name is Joy Ashby Cornthwaite and I will be your host today. I'm a certified diabetes care and education specialist and a volunteer with Cities Changing Diabetes Houston. Diabetes has little or no impact on a person's ability to do their job. And more often than not, employers do not even know whether or not their employee is living with diabetes. Nevertheless, because employers must provide reasonable accommodations to those living with diabetes or any other medical condition, today's episode will focus on how employees and employers can work together to address concerns around diabetes respectfully, to support the team, and to accomplish the work mission. So today's episode is coming up right now. You don't want to miss this. And as usual, before we begin, a gentle reminder, the content we share during this My Diabetes HQ live broadcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice. Always seek the counsel of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have concerning any medical condition, including diabetes. So this weekly broadcast, as you all know, is developed by and produced by Cities Changing Diabetes volunteers in Houston and Philadelphia. Our two cities are the U.S. members of a global network of 37 cities working to improve diabetes prevention, management, and care. You can learn more about Cities Changing Diabetes by going over to cityschangingdiabetes.com. The purpose of the My Diabetes HQ Live is to help people living with diabetes and their support teams. And today I'm honored to be joined by three amazing guests. We have Scott Ross. Hi, Scott. Hi, Joy. <laughs> Introduce yourself, Scott, to the uh, viewers. Okay, so, uh, well, my name is Scott Ross. I am a, an attorney and a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging business partner at Novo Nordisk. Um, and I'm also one of the co-leads for an employee resource group uh, for focused on living with diabetes at Novo Nordisk. We're called A1 Connection. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here this Saturday morning with us. Oh, thanks for having me. Awesome. And next we have John Griffin, a former national chair of ADA and human rights attorney. I'm going to let you talk to the folks about yourself because you're dynamic that way. Well, thanks, Joy. It's glad to be on here and good to be on with Scott and do it and the good work he's doing. And I love to see the, the, the A1C meaning, meaning something other than a lab value that sometimes <laughs> we fear. So that's great. Uh, I'm a lawyer by trade, as Joyce said, and I, I try civil rights cases around the country, generally for people with disabilities. And uh, in my day job, I do uh, insurance work, uh, employment work, things like that for clients. And uh, now, as of uh, three months ago, I have had my first grandkids. So that, that's even more fun, uh, even more fun than having a dog. Congratulations. Thanks. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm, I'm told this by my mom. <laughs> She loves her grandbabies. And Serena, she is our amazing lead for Houston Diabetes Peer Support. Um, and she is CEO of Core Initiative, a nonprofit here in Houston. Serena, welcome to the table. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I guess I introduced you, huh? Yeah, you did that very well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I don't mute myself. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, as I mentioned, everyone. Um, in the in introduction, I wanted to just set the tone and um, let all our viewers know that today we really want to focus on the partnership between employees and employers um, and with the end goal to be supporting health and wellness, um, as well as the mission of whatever organization a person lives with. Um, but also, you know, being mindful and addressing the concerns around diabetes in a professional and personalized ways. So um, who wants to start? You know, I think if we set the tone with um, your stories of entering the workforce and, and thinking about um, diabetes and how that impacts your, your work, um, who wants to start? 
Well, uh, okay. Go ahead, I, started, I only had diabetes as an adult. So uh, I didn't, I wasn't ready to go into the workforce with diabetes uh, at the beginning. I mainly was scared uh, out of my, uh, scared out of my gourd uh, to be in workplaces simply because I didn't know what was going to happen next. Uh, and it, the overlay of instructions of uh, doing finger sticks every hour or whatever, and uh, worrying about making sure that you take your insulin at the right time became sort of a, uh, I was afraid. Uh, and I was afraid that I would somehow let a client down uh, by having something having to do with me interfere with with the goals to be accomplished. And so that was the, my, my first struggle with it. And uh, I determined early on to let judges know uh, that I'd recently been diagnosed with diabetes and that there would be times when I need to be able to uh, get carbs, take a break, check a blood sugar, uh, and, and just let them know that because I'd rather them hear it from me uh, before a trial than in the middle of the trial and during an important witness, so testimony. So that, that was sort of my start. Mm -hmm. And Serena, what, you know, um, John has said that he informed people around him to make sure um, that he's able to still do his job. How do you, you know, how did you deal with it? Um, well, what I did, um, I actually found, got my diagnosis uh, while doing my first job, my very first real job, I should say. And um, uh, I I had to notify my boss that I was in the hospital. So my boss came to see me in the hospital and she, was, she just mentioned that, um, uh, well, get well so you can go back to work. So uh, <laughs> I came back to work. Everybody, um, she told everyone, everyone was kind of, was really kind of supportive, you know, of it. But um, before I found out I was, they were saying, wow, we noticed that you were having the signs, but we didn't know. We thought you were just, you know, um, you were just partying too much or something like that because you were always tired. You always look tired and moving slow. And so they just kind of realized that, wow, you had the symptoms, but we didn't know it, and I wasn't paying attention to it. So, um, but it was it was okay. It, it transitioned pretty well, but I had to stop the twelve hour shifts because that that wasn't working too well for me. <laughs> and Scott, do you want to chime in? And was sure. your was you know? Do you have people? as part of the A1 connection who have similar experiences or have told you similar stories? Sure, sure. Yeah, it really varies from person to person and it probably varies a lot based on, I was gonna say type one versus type two, but I don't think that's really as much of a distinction because from my perspective, I have type one, I've had it since I was nine. Um, but I actually, I don't, I think the differences between them get over uh, exact, uh, overrated sometimes. I think that the experience of living with diabetes isn't, yeah, you know, the medical causes and everything might be different, but the experience of the patient, I, I think, um, is similar. But what I was going to say was, what I do think made a big distinction was that I was diagnosed at age nine. And so, um, in a sense, I don't remember that much of my life before. I mean, I remember little bits and pieces, but for the most part, I've basically just been living my life with diabetes. And so, like people have often asked me, oh, how do you manage your diabetes at work? And I used to be a litigator like like John. Um, and now I work, you know, inside the company at Novo Nordisk. Um, and, you know, like I've, I've always said I kind of manage my diabetes at work the way I manage the rest of my, <laughs> the way I manage, you know, high school and college and playing on sports teams. And it's just, it's a, it's a it's an obstacle, right? It's something you have to. It, it's an additional challenge that's added to your life. But I, don't know, I try to ma maintain a perspective to say, a lot of my coworkers probably have other challenges that they're dealing with that I don't see, and so I just try to remind myself when I get frustrated, um, if somebody says something you know ignorant at work or you know my greatest fear, similar to what John was saying, like walking into a courtroom and then feeling low and saying, oh, God, yeah. 
I mean, my biggest fear is, is giving an important presentation and I get up on stage or, you know, in front of the room and all of a sudden my sugar starts dropping and I'm like, am I nervous because of the presentation or is it because of my sugar or are they, causing, are they adding to each other? Um, but um, so these are all frustrations and things I deal with. But what I try to remind myself to stay sort of positive about it is that, you know, this is just a challenge that life has thrown me and the person in the office next to me could be dealing with a sick relative or some other, you know, really stressful financial. So everybody has their things and you just sort of, you control the controllable. And um, I don't know, that's how I, that's how I cope with it at work and everywhere else. Yeah. And so um, I, this question is for all of you and I kind of want us to all be on, you know, together and, and you can have a conversation with, with one another. Um, but do you think that you approach um, work with the same sort of like problem solving that you approach diabetes? Because you have all of these questions in your mind, you know, about timing of medication, um, when to check, when not to check, symptom management. Do you kind of take that, all of those problem solving skills and then apply them to the situations within your within your workplace. Do you think that is a way that um, that you all work to uh, sort of manage and and um, your diabetes while working? That's a that's a tough question. Uh, it, I I think that from my standpoint, knowing one's limitations is really important, and certainly for me. When I am in a trial, I'm really not thinking about diabetes 24-7 as I ought to be. Uh, if I were in my office, I have a CGM in my pocket. I have an insulin pen in my other pocket. Uh, that, that I am totally in control of blood glucose during the day. But during a trial, uh, I check out uh, from that. And the, the, in, in knowing your limitations, for me, that means it's better to be on a long-acting insulin, uh, a basal insulin, that I, I know that I, I know, no matter what I do during the trial, I'm not going to be in peril in any major way. And to make sure that I start the day with a, a little higher blood sugar than I normally would start if I were in my office, uh, knowing that I might be at a 200, 250 by lunch from stress, from whatever, but that is more controllable for me during the middle of a trial than it would be to go low or to be, you know, having ketones or, or, or things like that. And so I think all of us have different abilities to know our own diabetes. And I have so, so admired uh, those new pilots, those commercial pilots who are in the sky, because in all circumstances, they know their blood glucose just like they know the altitude of the aircraft. They are that focused on being what I call the perfect patient. You know, they just do it all right. Most of us are not that perfect, so we have to take measures to protect ourselves, knowing what our limitations are, at least speaking for myself. Yeah, and I, I asked that question because as an educator, I try to... Um, you know we're we're problem focused and we're and we're trying to you know coach um, our patients living with diabetes how to live their best life, and so I think um, you know on the other side of it I'm also a manager, and so I'm thinking of all of you know all of the things that are within my ability to to offer and to provide for my staff, and then also thinking of ways that. Um, you know, like if you do, like you're saying, John, I never really thought about like, you know, if you're in your moment and you're doing your work, you may have checked out to where you're not answering all the questions in your mind. Um, and just framing that in ways of creating solutions um, for, for people living with diabetes. Yeah, and it's like uh, some of you may remember the, uh, the, the very talented uh, life coach therapist that was on the show a couple of months ago, we talked about self-compassion and understanding yourself and not getting down on yourself or blaming yourself uh, 
in that way. And so once you kind of say, well, this is who I am, uh, it's all about the A1C and it's all about keeping the A1C in a safe place and not getting yourself in trouble. Then, it, then you can say, well, you're good at other stuff, John. You're just not good at, at as good as those air, those commercial airline pilots with insulin treated diabetes. They're better at it than you. And that's why you're a lawyer and they're pilots. <laughs> oh, no, you're good at your job, John. Come on. <laughs> Uh, we'll give them what they do and we'll give you what you do (laughs) airplane (laughs) no i will remember them i like what john said i think that's a really good way to approach diabetes whether it be at at the workplace or just in in living your life is that um it's you know it's almost impossible to be perfect in anything and and that goes for controlling diabetes and so um there's that cliche some I've heard around the workplace, you know, don't let perfect be the enemy of, of good. Um, and I've really tried to apply that everywhere, um, but particularly for my diabetes, for my diet, for, for working out. Um, I'm not going to have a perfect A1C every time. I'm not going to always be in range, but try my best. Um, do as much as I can. And you got to live your life a little bit, right? <laughs> I think sometimes people burn out trying, you know, you get frustrated that it's not perfect and then people sort of fall off completely. And that's really the worst thing you can do. So, um, so I really, what you said, John, about, you know, can't be perfect really resonated with me. And um, as far as the other question about skills, I never really thought about it that way, but I have thought about it in terms of multitasking. Um, mm-hmm. I, I read an article recently that said, you know, studies show that multitasking is really bad and people can't be productive when they're multitasking, which is probably true. But my first reaction was like, tell that to a diabetic because that's all I do is multitask. (laughs) You know, I'm worried about my blood sugar right now while I'm talking to you guys. There's always something going on with uh, managing my diabetes as a secondary task. Um, And that that goes for the workplace too. (laughs) (laughs) This guy is going... It's yeah. a good morning, y'all. <laughs> um, I was gonna say I um uh I definitely like the the you can't be perfect. I keep hearing uh Rafa's voice in my head when she says uh uh imperfection is perfection or something like that, Joey Remy. Uh yeah, that, I, yeah. I keep, shout out to Rafa very Yeah. <laughs> I I keep hearing that. So yeah, that's so true. Um I, I tend, I don't know, I just, I tend to run everything together because it used to be where I would separate, okay, well, this is my life with diabetes and this is my life at work. And I figured out that didn't work for me. <laughs> it didn't work for me. I had to somehow fuse it together and be like, okay, I got to get this done and I got to get that done. So how am I going to get it done together? So it's, I, it's, it's, it's and I'm still learning. So I'm I'm yeah. still learning, but it's it's a journey. It's a process. <laughs> so then do you all have supporters who can help you, you know, while you're at work, or do you have a trusted like colleague or friend um who you feel that you can turn to if you know if you need some support or if you need, you know, a moment or or um some assistance maybe with a hypo or well, for me, I, uh, my, a lot of my community of friends and relationships are people who have diabetes. So I'm blessed, I'm blessed in some sense that there's a lot of people I can talk to about what's going on uh, mm-hmm. or what happens when I go off medication for a couple of weeks because I didn't get enough pills from the pharmacy uh, and sort of deal with those kinds of questions. But uh you know, having the supportive family makes it a lot easier. And for, for me, I, I have a niece, a nephew, and a sister who passed a couple of years ago, all uh, all with type 1 diabetes. And so it, it's my family is, 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 is full of full of diabetes. And uh, so th- that, that's also a close knit community. And, and as I've been through meet churches, meetings, groups in the community. I've watched a lot of young people uh, go through being diagnosed as, 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 as like at the age of nine 
uh, like we just heard, mm -hmm. and watching them and modeling good behavior for them to be anything they want to be and not, not let them be held back. But I had a question for the group to sort of think about. How do you guys deal with well-meaning people who ask or say things that are that, 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 that really, excuse my language, piss me off uh, when a judge or a lawyer says something like, well, uh, we should take a break because he has diabetes uh, or it, he maybe maybe he maybe he's having a blood sugar issue. Uh, at exactly the time they want to interrupt an examination that's not going their way. And it, how do we deal with well-meaning people who say or ask things that uh, are, are either ill-informed or designed in some cases to embarrass us? I'm gonna throw that over to you, Scott. <laughs> sure. I have to think about how I'm gonna say it in a nice way. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, what I was gonna say was this isn't necessarily what I do every time, but what I try to do when I'm being conscious about it um, is sort of that that same just sort of assume good intent from people until until shown otherwise. Um, because the reality is, and, and even at a company like Novo Nordisk, where the average knowledge about diabetes is much better than in the average workplace for certain, but even, you know, even here, um, a lot of people will say things, do things, you know, that they, they mean well, but, but they're just, um, they're, I hate to use the word ignorant. It sounds so negative, but yeah, they, they just don't know better. And so I've always tried to look at it, um, as an opportunity to educate someone, um, and sort of tell it. And that was in some ways, that was the impetus for starting um, our employee resource group was that I found that there were a lot of people at my company that knew about diabetes, but if they were a medical or science person, they knew the science behind it. Or if they were a, a regulatory or some of my you know, colleagues in legal, they knew the, the laws and regulations, but they really didn't necessarily know it from the perspective of a person who's living, you know, who's walking around the office with diabetes, living with it. Um, and so that was part of the impetus was I wanted to sort of have an internal voice of people with diabetes to share from a patient's perspective, here's how it is. Um, and sometimes people would say or do things that, like John said, are well intended, but it's sort of, and you hate to be that, uh, that mansplainer, but I sometimes found myself saying, well, I, like, I was a diabetes explainer, I guess. It's like, well, actually, <laughs> it turns out. <laughs> Uh, yeah. That. So yeah, I try to just remind myself that they probably meant well, and then take it from there and say, well, okay, Scott, so what you should be doing is educating them rather than scolding them. And I don't know, catch more flies with honey, I guess. Yeah, I really like, um, I know Serena wants to say something, but I really like the idea and I, I want to highlight it for the viewers of assuming that someone is wanting to help you first, and then um, and then just informing them and educating them. And I think that's my, you know, that's my teacher, my educator side um, coming out. But, and it sounds like, of course, we're advocates for diabetes. And so, you know, we are, much of what we do is advocating and teaching and learning. And so it may be different from a viewer experience. Um, but I think, I find that a lot of people actually want to know because diabetes is more prevalent than mm -hmm. and more spoken about in the open than it was say when my parents were diagnosed 30 years ago when i was a kid like no nobody t said that anybody else had was living with diabetes like you just didn't know it was like a kind of like i don't know intentional unintentional secret um but i think nowadays so many people are more aware family members are sharing and so I think sometimes people in your workplace can see in you a person that they really love. And so they really actually do want to understand mm -hmm. and they do want to help. So um, I really love that you said that, you know, just assume that they're coming from a good place and, and educate them. I don't know about some of those judges, John, but most people I think are coming. From <laughs> <good place>. <laughs> <laughs> or they might just need a break, John. And they're <laughs> like, most most of the judges are considerate 
and uh, sometimes they will even ask, do you want the, the veneer panel or the jurors to know you have diabetes? Uh, and usually I'd say, no, I don't. I, I think that my injections are so discreet in the suit pant and the pen is not really known as anything but a pen in your pocket. Uh, and the monitor looks like a pager, probably not. But, you know, sometimes the, sometimes the judges will make light uh, make make light of it uh, and uh, at one point in a case in Indianapolis uh, the other side made a big stink uh, when I did a finger stick while they were examining while their lawyer was examining their witness and this was a diabetes case the, the first case against the IRS for banning special agents with insulin treated diabetes and the lawyer stood up and objected and said, Mr. Griffin is trying to curry favor with the jury. Uh, and the judge says, come up. And the judge says, what's, your, what's the problem? I just saw Mr. Griffin take out his glucose meter and, and, do, and perform a finger stick at counsel table. And the judge says, well, how do you know this? Well, I saw it. I said, he, said, he said, so what? Uh, what what difference does it make? So what if the jury knows? You don't think everybody in this whole courtroom knows Mr. Griffin is has diabetes and is on the board of the directors of the largest diabetes organization in the world or whatever? Uh, sit down. He has a right to check his blood sugar and he doesn't have to do it in the closet. So in that case, the judge who was really kind of crust, crotchety and crusty uh, at some points, of course, I suppose I'm guilty of that as well some, but uh, the judge in that event basically said, get out of here. Uh, if that's the worst thing you got to complain about. But, you know, what we see in daily life is at Thanksgiving or Christmas, somebody who's not in the family is saying, you can't eat that. Uh, you have diabetes. You can't have that. And I usually smile and say, get out my insulin pen and say, yes, I can. <laughs> and I am. Because <laughs> I like eating because <laughs> you know your diabetes. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So guys, when when does it cross over to being a situation that's concerning, right? So when does it cross over to where it is something that's discriminatory and you there are protections in place to protect you? You know, I know that you all are very strong individuals and um and you can hold your own, but there may be some people who you know, someone says something like that to them and it it's demeaning. Um, it throws them off their game for their work that day. Um, when should someone say, this is discrimination and I need to get higher authorities involved? Well, for me, and, and, and Scott may have some thoughts about this from a different perspective, but when I talk to employers and employer groups, it's important that they learn the language uh, to utilize when when talking about people they are aware have disabilities, that, that they should not be segregated or identified as people with disabilities. They should be identified as workers like everybody else. And so when, when an employer does what the Postal Service did to a young woman, made light of her condition, told her co-worker she was a liability, and why in the world would you ever want to work at the post office? This young woman has had seizure epilepsy since she was young, but type one diabetes child, could, young person could be exact same thing. Uh, why would you ever want to be on this dangerous job on the floor of the post office where you have all these sorters when you could X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. That, that's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. She's entitled to be judged on the quality of her work and not her diagnosis or fears about what if. Uh, and that I think it, it's important for employers to be able to get their workforce to understand, don't be commenting or volunteering information about coworkers in front of coworkers or even in private, unless the conversation is initiated by the worker with diabetes, him or herself. For example, in an accommodation situation, that's different. But I think from my standpoint, being sensitive to these are people first, workers first. It's one of the facets of their lives that they live with diabetes. 
And that should not be controlling the conversation uh, of the employer and supervisors at work and how much that is in the in the in the atmosphere at an employer should be directed by the person who has the condition not the employer at least that's my view of it scott you're nodding sure <laughs> yeah, i i agree with everything john said um i've really been i i, I guess as far <laughs> It's weird to say this in the context of having diabetes, but um, as far as living with diabetes, I, I guess I check a lot of sort of privilege boxes um, in my life. Uh, just you know, being diagnosed as a as a young man, as a as a kid, um, and always having access to to quality care. Um, but one of the other ways I've, I suppose I've been privileged is at least in the last twenty years since law school. You know, I worked for about 10 years at different law firms in employment, labor and employment teams. Um, and so if there's any group of people who understand like the rights of employees, <laughs> it's a, an <laughs> labor and employment. So I've never really had um, that concern. And then I came to a, you know, a company like Novo Nordisk, who's, you know, been in the diabetes business for 100 years. So, again, I. I've really been privileged to not have to experience. Um, and so there might be these little microaggressions that have happened over the years, but never anything where I felt so significant that I, you know, that I thought for a second that I needed to do anything other than just have a one-on-one -on -one, um, conversation. But I think the way John said it is right. Really, um, the driver of that conversation should be the, the individual, the employee, um, the, the worker, the person with diabetes. Um, and I was thinking about, when John, when you were saying that, I was thinking about how um, not in the past year since there's been the pandemic, but before that, <laughs> we were all mostly physically in an office. You know, it was common. We'd have these birthday celebrations and people would bring in the cakes and and pastries and all that. And I'd always be sort of um, frustrated because it's sort of like, Scott, do you want a slice? And they'd put this huge piece of cake in front of me. And I wanted to be like, you know. You know, I'm like the poster boy for diabetes in this. You know, I, you know, I can't eat that. Why are you putting it in front of me? But then when I think back again with that good intent, I'd rather have them ask me and have me say no thank you than have the person just pass over me and not offer me the cake, right? So to John's point, it's sort of like, I appreciate that even though now I have to have the internal conflict of that looks delicious, but I really can't eat it. Um, at least I'm deciding that and someone isn't making that decision for me. So I don't know. It just, when, when you said that, John, I was like, that's a perfect example of where I appreciate when I think about it, I appreciate that people aren't making that call for me, that they're, they're leaving it in my hands to say, no, thanks. I'm going to have this, uh, peanuts or something. Mm -hmm. Well, what, I, don't know and, I was trying to ask Scott a question of, of, to get a little more, uh, uh, mm -hmm. learn a little bit more about the A1C that sort of peer group for people with diabetes, because we don't have very many or groups to network with in any organized way. So can you share a little bit about what, what A1C is and who it's for? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, employee resource groups have become a fairly, you know, popular phenomenon at uh, a lot of companies over the last 20, 30 years. And we have eight wonderful groups at Novo Nordisk, um, women in Novo Nordisk, African-Americans in Novo Nordisk, veterans, um, and several others. And it was about five or six years ago, I, I realized that I'd met a lot of colleagues who had a person, that's a, one reason why a lot of people want to work for my company is they have a personal stake in, in diabetes care. Um, and so, yeah, so a few of us got together and said, hey, let's, uh, let's form a, one of these groups, uh, but you know, we came up with, as John, you, you picked up on the pun, A1 connection. It, it works on multiple levels because of the A1C. Um, <laughs> but the goal really is sort of, um, I, I usually say there's like three, it's sort of a three-part, three-pronged approach. Um, one is, to, like I was saying before, to serve as sort of a resource and a voice for people living with diabetes, both inside and outside the company. Um, bringing greater education and awareness of the experience of living with diabetes to our colleagues. And that's sort of what I was talking about also before about how people might know one aspect about diabetes, but not the, the living experience. And then, um, you know, supporting the companies, you know, both from a business perspective, but also its commitment to improving the lives of people with diabetes. So it's sort of those things all sort of overlap. But 
you know, like all of our employee resource groups, you don't have to have diabetes to join. Um, we have approximately 300 members and I, you know, I, we don't require people to self-identify, but based on the people I know, um, it's probably about 40 to 50 that actually have diabetes themselves. Um, many others who I would say live with diabetes in the sense that they might have a, a partner or spouse or parent or sibling or child, um, someone very close to them who, who has diabetes. And so in a real sense, they also live with diabetes from that perspective. And so um, that's sort of what we're all about. We do a lot of collaboration with the other employee resource groups where appropriate. Um, last November on, uh, around World Diabetes Day fell on a weekend, but right around World Diabetes Day, we sponsored a program on addressing um, health disparities and biases in diabetes care. And then we had sort of a follow-up um, discussion between the members of, of A1 Connection, um, the African-Americans in Novo Nordisk and uh, the Hispanics and Latinos uh, uh, organization, which is called OLA. Um, and we've, you know, we've done things like that. We've had, um, we have these periodic sort of quarterly just group meetings, which have all been done, you know, on Zoom or, or Teams we use. Um, but those, we call them how you do in sessions. Uh, and those are really just, those are sort of those discussions that can go off in a direction about what's the latest CGM, what's the latest, you know, supplies, insulin pump technology. Uh, last year, there was a lot of talk about particular challenges during the COVID pandemic of, of trying to manage your diabetes. And so that that's a big part of it. And then, you know, we sponsor these information campaigns. We have within the company, there's all kinds of um, activities where you can have people sign up and learn about different things. So we try to do that. And then a part that I feel really strongly about, and this is picked up, it took a few years for this to gain traction, but we now have some teams that'll come to us um, and say, hey, we're exploring, you know, let's say different digital solutions to help people with diabetes. Are there, you know, five to 10 people from your group who might wanna sort of advise us from a patient perspective? And, and that's what I, that's what I thought was kind of missing when I, you know, we, a few of us had this idea to start the group. We said, yeah, they should really like take advantage of the fact that so many people within the company have that experience and, and use it so that we're coming up with solutions that are, you know, will help people that live with diabetes. So I don't know, I could go on for hours, but I, I, I'm sure other folks want to talk, but, but that's a little bit about the group and, and it's nice to see that it's really picked up over the last few years. Yeah. And the, you know, I like that there's this important component of peer support that's applied to and from like an employee space. Um, because I think, you know, Serena does our peer support. So jump in Serena um, here in Houston. But, you know, I think that that having a safe space with other people that understand you that um, or that, you know, in that safe space will accept questions and um, and connect with you. I think is very, very important to allowing you to open yourself up to more knowledge about diabetes. What do you think, Serena? Uh, definitely, um, I believe every, every cause uh, diabetes is so prevalent at every workplace that there should be something in place for people with diabetes who, who work at their workplace. Um, I know uh, in, in peer support, we talk a lot about different things and a lot of people talk about their jobs, um, it, including myself. It, it kind of depends on the type of job you have uh, because sometimes with other jobs, I'll say it that way, uh, sometimes employers don't care about you having diabetes. And um, I, I've experienced that myself. Um, I won't, I'm definitely not going to name any, <laughs> any companies <laughs> to get anybody in trouble. But there, there were a few times I had to speak up for myself and others because we were not allowed a break to eat. Even if you tell them you have diabetes, well, you should take care of that before you come. But the shift is eight hours. So how can I take care of that before I come? You know, diabetes doesn't take a break for eight hours. You know, your blood sugar's moving. So 
Um, I, I just try to tell the people who are part of our peer support group, uh, um, and that, I'm sorry. Okay. I'll go ahead and talk about that. That flashed on the screen. Shameless plug. <laughs> Shameless plug. Um, we are on Facebook folks. So it's called the Houston diabetes peer support program. Um, we have a Facebook group. And so if you go in the search bar of Facebook and type in Houston diabetes peer support program, look for this particular, um, a logo and um, join the group. We would love to have you. Our group is growing uh, so much. And so we have a lot of different people from all different walks of life. But um, as I was saying, when uh, when I talk to the people in peer support, I try to get them to advocate for themselves at work, uh, 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 you know, vocalize, hey, I have diabetes, so I need my breaks. And there are certain rules, uh, according to work Workforce Commission, that you you have to have a break. You have to have a break. Um, over an eight hour period, no breaks. That's that's not that's not cool at all. And especially if you have diabetes, you might need a snack. You might need to check your blood sugar. You know. So I I try to get people to advocate for themselves at work. Yeah. So how can we as, so oftentimes I get this question um, from from patients asking for letters, for medical letters that, um, that, you know, speak to them needing a break or being a part of their, a part of their plan. Um, how, now that we have two attorneys on a podcast, <laughs> podcast <laughs> Um, sometimes, you know, sometimes they come back and they say, yeah, the doctor wrote me a note, but they're not, they're not, um, they said they don't have to abide by it because it's a doctor's note. Yeah, I think employers get in a lot of trouble, uh, when they ask for a doctor's note and then disregard the information provided from the, from the medical, uh, person. It, it, it the employers are obligated to judge people on their actual ability and their actual situation. And if they make an assumption that a person with diabetes or epilepsy is dangerous, it has to be based on an individualized assessment. It's based on the most current medicine. Uh, and an employer who goes off half cocked, like what you described, uh, would be very, very dicey. I wouldn't want any of my clients to be uh, doing anything like that, Joy, because mm -hmm. it it's the opposite of what the law really has in mind. And while employers do have certain rights, if an employee has some on the job issues in performance, they can order a fitness examination that's reasonably designed to make sure that that person's condition does not cause a, a risk, a substantial risk in the workplace. But even then, when the, when the doctor says, this person is not a, a significant risk, company's not at liberty or not uh, really in a position to say, we disagree, we're not going to let this person work. And that's what the Americans with Disabilities Act was designed to prevent, is employers judging people on stereotypes and fears instead of the reality of their ability to work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what would your advice be to someone who's experiencing that in the workforce? Like just general... I, I mean, I, I don't know what you can say, you know, because we haven't, you know, we haven't assigned you as our attorney or anything like that, anybody on the viewing. But just in general, you know, would you recommend someone go talk to their HR office, go talk to, like, who should they talk to if their supervisor isn't hearing? Because that's kind of what Serena's saying. Like, if your supervisor isn't acknowledging you and you don't have all of the you know, acumen or the experience um, or, you know, legal training, <laughs> what, what should your next steps be? Well, I think it depends on the employer's conduct. If the employer is imposing restrictions or denying accommodations, then the first step is to request the accommodation and initiate a discussion in good faith and have an interactive dialogue with the appropriate people at the employer. Uh, they should have that conversation. Uh, it, if it's being disqualified or let go or not allowed to work, uh, 
that can be taken to a, 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 an EO uh, department if it's a large company, but it also, if, if, if the cat's out of the bag and you're already terminated, uh, the, the, it's sort of too late then to, to uh, unscramble that egg that those people have to go to the EEOC and, and they need to fill out the intake form and have the EEOC conduct an investigation uh, after which the, the person can uh, bring a suit if there's no conciliation during the EEOC process. So uh, I, I do think that the, you're, it's easy for me to say this because I get these calls all the time, people in that precarious situation. My normal first thought is possession is nine tenths of the law. Whatever you do, don't let them fire you. Okay, take your medicine for a while, put up with this a little while, make your complaint, go, get, get it in writing, talk to the key people. That'll make it more difficult for them to fire you because you have, you have actually given them notice of what the problem is. And then if they retaliate against you, then that's yet another thing that would not be lawful. So uh, you, my thought is yes, go to the, the appropriate people within the organization, give them a chance to listen and work with you. And if they don't, uh, you're under, you can, even if you're not fired, you still can go to the EEOC as an employee and have them help. And we have several clients who are working today without a service animal, a service dog, uh, because they're just taking flashbacks and suffering through them at work. Uh, so, but we're still, we've got a suit pending in, in uh, Little Rock on July 12th over a service dog. The guy is actually working. Uh, we didn't want him to get fired because he's got a wife and kids. Uh, I mean, he's supporting a family. So uh, those are difficult questions for sure. But I do think people should uh, not hold it in and, and bear the problem because usually that it has a bad end for the worker. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much, John. That's that's good because I'm sure there are people who are watching who are like, you know, the four of you have a really good working relationship at work and 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 um, considerations for those living with diabetes and lots of knowledge, you know, and from that space of knowledge and and desire for advocacy, we're going to come to our workplace in a completely different space. Um, but there may be individuals who, you know, um, find themselves in uh, situations like what Serena had, where, you know, they're looking and they're asking, like, what do I do if I don't have that much support besides just coming and working with all of y'all? So, <laughs> so um, for those viewers that are transitioning, so, um, and this might be a question for Scott first, so college to work life, or even for um, our other panelists from work to work, how do, um, do you have any tips for them um, thinking about their um, diabetes in those transitional phases? Sure. Um, yeah, I guess I'm trying to think back to my early jobs. I can think way back to like jobs I had in high school and college. Not that like, way back, Scott. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a long time. To, to put it in perspective, I worked at Blockbuster Video, so. <laughs> <gasps> Love me some blockbuster. <laughs> it was a long time ago. So um, yeah, but um, but yeah, I guess when I think back, you know, my first job before I went to law school, I worked for a few years um, in consulting. So that wasn't either a legal or a diabetes, you know, like that. Maybe I was, uh, but I, I guess I, I would say, uh, you know, I didn't necessarily lead with the fact that I had diabetes, but I didn't keep it a secret either. I kind of just let it come up in conversation naturally. Um, you know, back then I was probably, you know, I was obviously, well, maybe not obviously, I was less mature, I like to think, than I am now. Um, but I, I still think that the best way to sort of handle diabetes in the workplace, you know, where possible, and, and assuming you're not facing like real challenges, like the kind of challenges Serena was talking about, but where possible is to try to treat it the way you treat it, you know, in your dating life, in your academic life, in your social life, right? It's, it's a, it's a nuisance. Um, but it's something that you want to sort of manage so that it doesn't take more space than it, than it needs to, um, to put it in, in terms that another attorney will, will appreciate, um, make it a footnote in your life and not, you know, in the main text, 
right? Um, so that's uh, that's kind of how I've always tried to view it. And that would be the advice, you know, if, if uh, a 22 year old, I'll say kid, um, said, oh, I'm starting my first, you know, real job, what, what should I do? I, that's what I would tell them. I would say, you know, don't ignore your diabetes, <laughs> speak up when you need to speak up, but don't let it take over. Don't let it take more space in your brain than it needs to. Just do what you got to do to manage it and not let it be too much of an obstacle. Awesome. I think that's a good message for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, diabetes as a footnote, not as your, not as your main page. John, Serena. My thought, I, since I didn't have it as a child, uh, I've grown to respect 20 something year olds uh, with diabetes or in some cases seizure disorder or epilepsy. And I would make this observation uh, and it, it, I get emotional when I think about it. Being in your twenties, it, it's, a, it's a tough job going from school into the workplace, relationships, your brain is still being formed. It seemed at least I was when I was in my early twenties. Mm -hmm. To have that overlaid with a chronic condition, these young people are sort of fragile uh, more than most, especially kids with type one. And, and I have a lot of type two clients as well. And I'm first officially diagnosed with type two myself. But most of these kids are fragile when they're type ones or when they have seizure disorder because other people they see are defining them by their condition and not their, who they are. And so th that's, to, to Scott's point, helping them get to be thought of as your diabetes is a footnote. And you won't let other people make it into the body of your work. Uh, you will keep it as a footnote. And you will uh, have self-compassion for yourself uh, as when forgot an insulin dose or forgot to take the seizure, the, the, the seizure disorder medicine uh, and, and, and had a seizure. Those are things that really, really uh, challenge the, the inner core of extremely bright, talented young people first entering the workforce. And I, not, not to get too deep in the story, but an 18 year old was working for the post office, the same woman her first job and people in supervisory positions made fun of her and treated her as if she was going to be a cripple for the rest of her life merely because she had a seizure. And the guilt of not taking the medicine and the employer telling her she's a liability and taking her off the floor and doing all this business. And why did you ever want to work for the post office? Those are all things that had, had a terrible effect on an 18 to 20 year old young woman. And so I think that we have to, we have to have the kind of compassion and role modeling for those young people that they know there are groups out there to, to join together to help them because there's millions of people with diabetes. These people who have this happen to them are not the only ones. They feel so alone. But, they, but they're, they, they can be united with the thousand points of light through people like Scott, Serena, Joy, all of us to help them uh, get, to, get to their 30s and 40s when we're not quite so fragile. At least that's sort of my observation of representing a lot of 20-somethings. Yeah, and and before I let Serena jump in and say an entire word, <laughs> I want to respond to what to to what um, <laughs> you both have just said, Scott and John, um, because like just thinking about a one connection and thinking about what you've said, um, John, about you know that sort of that time of growth that you're experiencing and and like establishing your new home and new work, there's a lot of new happening. Um, but I also have patients who are in that transitional phase that I look at them and I am actually in awe of their strength. Like those moments, you know, I think, um, mm -hmm. I don't want anyone to think that your use of the word fragile because language is important, right? 
So I don't want them to think that your use of fragile means that it's some way, um, you know, less than. Um, I think it's that fragility in terms of um, of a place and time where you're changing. There's so much change that mm-hmm. you have to manage all those changes together. Um, but what I've learned from my younger patients who live with diabetes, any any type of diabetes, is that they have a strength that is not inherent in young people. Um, because growing up as a child with parents who live with diabetes, but my, my I myself did not, I was allowed a freedom of, you know, kind of being a youth without much responsibility that my youth, my people, and my friends and my patients who live with diabetes as youth are not allowed. They grow up very fast. And to see a nine-year-old who can, um, give themselves an insulin injection and do all of the numeracy skills, calculating a correction dose. I mean, I am in awe of that. So um, I, I want to say that even during those fragile times, young people should recognize their amazing strength. Like they're just incredible. And, um, and now I want to start an A1 connection at our workplace for for the youth who don't think that we look at them that way. Um, and, and I look at them that way. I'm in awe of a 21 year old who can balance, you know, pregnancy, work and diabetes. That mm-hmm. is a strength that I cannot even begin to understand. So I'll let Serena say a whole. Um, that's good, Joy. <laughs> Um, I was just going to say that um, I would just say to know your limitations and act accordingly. Um, When I was diagnosed, I was 20, so I was in school and working. And um, I had to scale back some things. I even had to talk to my boss and be like, I got to scale back some hours. I'm not feeling good. I got to get the hang of this, you know, getting sleep and making sure I eat, didn't get a good routine. And then I still got to input school work in there. So it's like, I, you know, it, it, it was a rough transition, but I would just say, know your limitations and do what you need to do for you. I mean, if that means communicating with your boss, um, if that means cutting some extra activities out because you have to focus on your health, your body will thank you later for it, you know, for you taking taking the time to take care of yourself. So I would just say know your limitations. You guys are so great. Yeah, I think Scott. I think that's right. I, I was thinking about what Serena said, but I, I think the part about take you know take care of yourself too is is an important part of your message, even though it was it wasn't the main. <laughs> besides the limitations, I think what you said about at the end of the day, you have to take care of you, and you shouldn't. Um, this is the uh, more advice I would give is you know don't don't feel ashamed, don't feel embarrassed, don't feel like oh I'm inconveniencing this person by asking for something. Um, and ultimately you have to put yourself, you know, put your own needs, you know, somewhere near the top. Right. Um, and so don't, don't worry about, um, you know, being an inconvenience or a, a, a nuisance to people do what you have to do and, and, and you matter. So, you know, always remember that. Super. One question that comes to mind in view of what we've talked about a little bit is how do we help people to trust uh, those who are trying to help? In other words, we've seen in our country uh, more distrust of medicine, science, uh, and conspiracy theories about things like that. And of course, all of us have probably seen the emails and texts that you can eat a certain kind of orange and never have diabetes again, and you'll never need insulin again. Uh, but people do seem, I mean, we have a, you know, close to 30, 40% of the American people don't have vaccinations for COVID because they uh, have, have been driven to the point where they're, they're, they're adversarial with the institutions uh, that do this. And Scott, from your perspective, 
of being at a very progressive insulin company, uh, how 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 do we better get secure the trust of not only our community but others who don't have diabetes about what diabetes really is and what it really is not. And in some ways, that's a, a million-dollar question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess the best you can do is, is try to educate. And um, I think, John, uh, maybe it was Joyce, somebody said earlier about when you know people, right, when, when there's that personal experience, um, that goes a long way when you actually live with someone or have a good friend or even a coworker and you see what living with diabetes or any struggle really, but in the context of diabetes, when you can really see it through the eyes of someone you know and, and care about, um, I think that goes a long way. Um, it sort of puts that, uh, that empathy piece to it to sort of be able to put yourself in that person's shoes. But as far as sort of what do you do to, to counter sort of, Cause yeah, I, I that's beyond my. <laughs> no, I don't really. <laughs> yeah, that's like a you know. I think I think one of the things that you are doing, Scott, and that Serena's doing, um, through uh, the peer aspect, I think people will trust because there's so much distrust. Um, I think that, you know, sifting through that, um, oftentimes is helpful and and far more meaningful. And believable if it comes from someone else who's living your experience. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, I thank you both for what you're doing for your peer members because it's really, really important. Um, you know, because even if my patients feel that they trust me, they don't trust me as much as they trust their peers. They never will. Um, and, and that's okay. And I know that. Um, and because that, that sheared that shared experience is what boosts that trust. And so I think, John, I think your question is, you know, there's so many components to how, and, and so many different ways in which to build the trust. But I think that Serena and Scott here have one of those key components, which is a trusted peer support, um, you know, group that you feel connected to. And maybe that is our so, uh, what we take from this is each of us has our own place with people within our circle to tell our stories. And uh, I'm an evangelist for insulin. I'm an evangelist for uh, Bidurian and Trulicity, uh, with, especially with all my type 2 friends. Uh, so uh, they're scared of all that stuff because it's big pharma and it's sticking yourself with a needle. Uh, but I try to just be positive. Well, look, I lost 25 pounds. Uh, with those kinds of drugs and insulin, and you can too. Uh, and so, anyway, I think that I think Scott makes a good point. It, it's about who you know. I don't know who. I guess Serena maybe was started, but we have to influence those within our own circles and who, with whom we interact in our own lives. Mm -hmm. Each of us so has finding, a yeah. So finding trusted peers at work and in your community and online. That's why it's so important. So thank you. You, you are my trusted peers and I'm so um, grateful for you. And, um, you know, and as a person who has a stake in diabetes, um, that is my family um, and my very, very close friends. Um, thank you three for being here this morning. It's really, really amazing and, and um, wonderful of you to take time out of your day for that. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Don't we worry, always get more out of it than anybody else. So thanks for letting me be a part. <laughs> and I'll be calling all of you back. <laughs> so <laughs> I tell everyone that you you'll you'll come back in some capacity. I'm hopeful. <laughs> so thank you guys so much. Have the best day. Y'all too. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. So thank you everyone for being here this morning. Um, Certainly we've learned today that balancing workplace responsibilities and health is important for everyone, not just those living with diabetes. Um, while there are definitely personal decisions to disclose your information or to maintain privacy around your workplace, 
um, people with living living with diabetes should understand their rights. And when um, individual individualized self care um, is limited or hindered um, by different policies, know your rights and and um, understand when to seek help help for that. Um, we hope that this conversation has revealed opportunities and resources to safeguard your careers and support your workplace missions. Join us um, next week. Mark your calendars. Our next episode will air on Saturday, June the 12th, 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And thank you so much for being a part of the My Diabetes HQ community. See you next time.